Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Barton Robison, and this is the second in a three series set of trainings I'm doing around working in Indian country. So if you didn't join us last time, we talked about uh, federal Indian policy and uh, looked at how from colonization up through the present day, the federal government primarily uh, has acted toward Native Americans. Today, we are here to talk about land acknowledgments. Um, and why people do them, why you should do them, uh, wrong ways to do them, and ways you can do them better. And then if you join us in a couple weeks, uh, we'll be wrapping up the series uh, with uh, working in Indian country. So that's going to be um, just some tips and tricks for folks who work with tribes or other indigenous populations um, of ways that you can be a better partner in your community engagement there. Quick overview of what we're going to do today. Um, if you have not yet, now is a great time to grab a sheet of paper and a writing utensil. We are going to have a little more interaction this session than we did the last one, uh, but don't worry. After that warm up activity, you can sit back and uh, just listen through some kind of lecture style education. And then we'll wrap things up uh, with some time for direct action and a QA session. To get started, I'm just curious to know what you already know about land acknowledgements. Um, some of these can be wild guesses, some of these can be things you've already done, uh, but I'm gonna pop open the chat for a, a few seconds. And if you've got anything that you already know about land acknowledgements, I would love to hear it. This will kind of give me a sense of where different folks are at, um, kind of if people are brand new to land acknowledgements, if they've done some before, I also recognize it takes some time to type. Ooh, dig that one. Listening to your tribal partners and creating land acknowledgements is a crucial first step. Definitely talk to that. Got a question, what is our action? Starting conversations. Work is more than land acknowledgement. Cool. So it seems like uh, at least a handful of folks are not completely new to the conversation, which is good. Um, hopefully uh, you still find the hour useful and we'll definitely get to some of those points that you brought up uh, coming on. I wanna open with a little warm up activity uh, that I borrowed from an indigenous partner who asked me not to offer attribution. Um, and this activity is called Three Precious Things. So this is where you're gonna need that piece of paper and your writing utensil. Um, and to start out, I want you to take a second and think about what three things are most precious to you right now in your life. Um, those can be things, they'd be objects, they could be people or relationships you have. Uh, it could be a pet, it could be something a little uh, enigmatic like a memory or a, uh, someone who's passed on. Um, but take a moment, think of those things, and then go ahead and write them down on that sheet of paper. And uh, I would love to know what some of those things are. So after you get a chance to write it down, um, feel free to share some in the chat just so we can kind of see what, what other folks are feeling, what's in their hearts today. Matt, pretty standard. Uh, <laughs> mine was pretty close. I have uh, Jason, who's my husband, Eastwood, who's my dog, and uh, my house. Lots of kids, lots of family, nature. Ooh, dancing, I like that one. All right. So as we're, we're typing those in and thinking about them, take a second and let's just do a couple deep breaths together um, and, and try to breathe in the feeling of those things. So 
what does it feel like to to be in the presence of your family and of your loved ones? What does it feel like to to be outdoors or out on the water? Um, what does it feel like to own a home? Um, so we'll take three breaths together and and try to internalize those feelings. So breathe in and out. Breathe those warm feeling in and out. One last time in and out. And now, um, go ahead and hold your paper up. I know we don't have cameras on. Uh, but hold it out in front of you. <sighs> Channel those feelings toward that paper of love and of your affection. And then I want you to rip your paper in half. And then rip it in half one more time. And then maybe crumple it up a little bit. And then drop it on the ground. And, uh, and step on it, if you're able. And then I want us to spend some time now sitting in that space of how it would feel if those things are torn from us. Um, and, and I know it's hard and challenging, but but try to go through each thing specifically and imagine how it would feel if that was taken from you. So um, for me, if, if my husband was taken away, um, if, if my dog, somebody else took my dog and then kept my dog, uh, if I came home one day and someone had kicked me out of my house and was preventing me from coming back in, and wouldn't let me have my things anymore. Um, and I want us to, to take a few more breaths and just sit in that space of how it feels to have those precious things that we felt so much love and affection for be torn up and then just thrown on the ground. Um, so same thing, take a deep breath in and out. Deep breath in. and out, deep breath in, and out, and as you, as you come back to the space, um, pay attention to your feelings right now. Uh, what is your, what does your body feel like? Are you, you feeling heavy in your shoulders? Um, is your heart beating fast? Do you feel anxious? Um, and I'm curious in the chat to know just what are some people feeling after having those things torn up and thrown on the ground? Despair is one I definitely relate to. Even this is not the first time I've led this exercise or done it, um, but I, I feel that dread. Uh, I feel that sadness and anxiety. My, my heart right now is kind of going, uh, going fast. I, I wanted to start with that exercise um, because I really want us to come to this conversation from a place of recognizing that land acknowledgements are heart exercises and they're not brain exercises. And I know for me, when I you know, started my, my learning journey around these and figuring out how to do them right, uh, what to do wrong, a lot of that 
that idea of rightness came from uh, a place of objectivity. So how do I know exactly which tribes were here? How do I say the name of the different bands right? Um, and that's the wrong way to approach it. So I want us all to, to hold those feelings inside um, and be able to, to learn from the space of being very heart-driven um, and recognizing that a lot of those feelings that you're feeling are pretty similar to feelings that indigenous people feel when land acknowledgments happen. So now feel free to, uh, to take a little step back, um, sit in those feelings, and I'm going to share some learnings with you. Good place to start is defining what is a land acknowledgement. And Sir Wikipedia tells us that it's a statement, usually at the beginning of an event or meeting, that the event is taking place on land originally inhabited by or belonging to indigenous people. And without doing a poll, I'm gonna assume that a lot of us have been in meetings where land acknowledgements have happened. Um, some of us may have even led them ourselves. And so the what is not exactly uh, what we're here to discuss today. What we're here to talk about is why do people do land acknowledgements? And a quick rundown of some pretty common answers. Uh, one is to bring attention to the history of a place and its people. Another one is to bring attention to tribal causes and raise awareness of local tribes who are still active in the area. A lot of people do it uh, just to signal their values. Um, there's not really a lot of other thought behind it. Um, and similarly, uh, some people do it because other people do it. And it kind of seems like this is what people are doing now. And it's probably the right thing to do. So we should do it. Where I'm gonna take our conversation is why should people do land acknowledgements? Um, there are a lot of different reasons that can motivate people, but I think even though we can't be objectively right in how to do them, there are some more right places from which a land acknowledgement can come. Quick disclaimer, uh, I'm still a white dude. I still uh, am not indigenous in any way, as far as I know. I am not a member of any tribe. Um, so I am only sharing this uh, because it helps take the burden off of other folks um, who this is very emotional and heavy lifting for. Uh, a lot of what I'm sharing comes out of my experience working directly with tribes, uh, including several in the Pacific Northwest. Um, some of it comes from my learnings in my grad program. I got a, a master's, um, or sorry, graduate certificate uh, in tribal relations from PSU. Um, comes from doing research online and just seeing what other indigenous writers from uh, not just the US, but like Canada and North America and other places have said about land acknowledgements. Um, but the views that I'm expressing are only those that are filtered through me and I am not right 100% of the time. So take everything I say with a grain of salt uh, and recognize that there is no right way to do or approach a land acknowledgement. Even though there is no right way to do a land acknowledgement, I'm pretty convinced there are a lot of wrong ways to do it. So uh, for those who are hoping to have a really clear pattern of a way to write one out, I'm sorry. Um, it's not what we'll be getting to today, but uh, I'm gonna share some soft rules for how to approach land acknowledgements that I think will help you um, be successful in bringing attention to those places you wanna bring attention to. Uh, knowing when to craft a land acknowledgement, um, and knowing that heart space that these come from. Rule number one will be familiar to folks who attended the last webinar, and that is you're always going to piss someone off. <laughs> so uh, I, I share this rule not as a place of like, oh, we don't have to care about it. People are going to be angry no matter what. Um, but I want to share this rule because I think it creates space and freedom for us to approach things not from such a Western objective right or wrong space, um, but from a place that really requires introspection uh, and personal research. Part of the reason you're going to piss people off is because tribal people aren't monolithic. Um, and so I have heard some folks from tribes uh, who say you should do this at every public meeting you, you lead. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say this is pointless. 
And I have heard a lot of people say, this is actively causing me harm and I'm mad at you. <laughs> um, one travel partner in particular, uh, I'm quite fond of, puts it as, it's like somebody is driving past you in your car that they stole and saying, hey dude, thanks, this used to be your car. Um, so it's a very diverse set uh, of, of views and opinions, even within Indian country on what this is like. Another reason you're gonna upset people is land acknowledgements generally include a mention of the people who lived there or currently live there and place and territory markers aren't objective. Uh, bands and tribes didn't write these things down. They traveled over large expanses of land. Um, and so no matter who you list, you'll probably leave someone out and you'll probably accept someone who's saying, hey, we were actually more here than these people. Um, and so again, there's not really an objective right or wrong way to know exactly uh, whose land you should be acknowledging. Uh, a third rule that I am hoping we all kind of feel a little bit is that land acknowledgements can be potentially re-traumatizing for folks or make light of a really serious issue to someone. Um, I have been in a meeting where somebody opened with a land acknowledgement and an indigenous person just left. <laughs> Um, and, and if you think about those feelings and that despair and that anger that you feel, um, it, it would be like opening a meeting saying, hey, uh, welcome to our meeting. I just want to acknowledge all of these horrible traumas and terrible things that Barton has gone through. Um, let's think about that for 15 seconds. Okay, and now let's talk about our quarterly budgets. Like <laughs> if that's all there is, you're bringing up something that is really emotionally affecting to me in a way that that's not treating it with the respect it deserves. But none of those are excuses uh, to not engage with land acknowledgements. Um, so my hope is that uh, we can we can hold these tensions, we can understand that people are going to have different reactions, and we can use that as a jumping off point to explore why they're uh, why they're powerful. Um, and how we can be more responsible with land acknowledgements. Rule number two um, is that you need to connect your land acknowledgement with a purpose. Um, awareness raising is one of those motivations I mentioned earlier. And in some instances, awareness raising is important. There are definitely still people in this country who don't know or have never actively thought about the fact that oh, uh, I am living on land that my ancestors occupied and colonized that belonged to someone else. But I would also say a lot of people already know that, um, especially people who tend to work in our circles in the environment who already work with tribes. And so your purpose has gotta be deeper than just, oh, I'm gonna tell people that tribes used to live here to raise awareness to it. Um, why is it important in this specific context? And in this, e drilling down even further, like at this meeting with these people on this day at this time. The more specific you can get with that purpose, um, the more successful you will be in delivering it. And you should share it. Uh, anytime I do a land acknowledgement with a group, it's always the first thing I lead with is I, I give people a heads up, hey, I want to do a land acknowledgement right now. And here's why I am doing it at this moment. If you can't think of that purpose or you're not able to share it with the group, then you probably shouldn't do one. Um, again, for reasons we discussed already, it can be really hard for folks. Rule number three is to lead with your heart. Um, don't read a land acknowledgement off a page. <laughs> if, if you remember those feelings you felt uh, during our exercise, if somebody said, I am so sorry you feel these things and that I stole your dog and your house and then put a paper down. Um, it, it doesn't communicate that feeling and doesn't connect with people on that level of what is really a very emotional issue. Um, so be vulnerable and show emotion. Um, this is a, a really good way to practice um, leading with your heart and being open which is something that's important to working with tribes. Um, and so it's okay if you get a little emotional when you do this. I, I would recommend 
finding a way to center yourself before you do it and really thinking through what am I feeling? Um, and what emotion do I want to convey through this? Also, uh, don't say we do this at every meeting. <laughs> that, that is a really clear way to say, I am signaling values and I am not showing emotion right now. Um, and it really pisses people off. Somebody already pointed out in the chat uh, a great idea, which is when possible, you should ask the tribes um, whose land you're actually acknowledging. Uh, if you don't have a relationship there or you just email them, don't expect to reply. <laughs> One of the tribes that I work with gets something like 20 or 30 of these a week of requests from partners that run the gamut from schools to churches to nonprofit organizations, government agencies saying, hey, do you have language? We're going to be in this spot. Can you tell us exactly what she would, we should acknowledge? Um, and by and large, they just don't respond because they have other more important things to do. But there are instances where it is super important and very helpful uh, if you ask the tribes about it, especially if they're going to be in the meeting. Um, one example is I was doing some work in a community with the tribe. We were about to have our first big kickoff meeting. And so uh, we approached them and said, hey, we're thinking that we should start this off with a land acknowledgement um, since you're a part of this project since we are uh, on your homelands. And they said, no, please don't, <laughs> because um, that is a tense issue in their community. And not only is it really fresh for them as a community uh, and a culture, it inflames tensions that they have with their neighbors. And so if we hadn't asked them and we had just done it thinking, oh, this will be a nice thing for the tribes, we, we actually could have actively been doing them harm um, and leaving a mess behind when our meeting was over. So always be very thoughtful, especially when tribes are in the meeting about how you do these and when you do them. And then my final soft rule uh, that everyone should follow is you should do more. And this is another one that a handful of people already know um, and mentioned. How else is your organization or you personally supporting tribal sovereignty in your work? Um, if, if all you're doing is a land acknowledgement and that's where you're starting, it's probably not a great place to start because there's so many other opportunities and ways that you can help build and support tribal sovereignty through your work instead of just a land acknowledgement. Um, one example is find out what tribes in your area are working on. Are there initiatives that overlap with what uh, your organization does or ways that you can support them? Sometimes it looks like offering technical assistance or capacity building. Uh, sometimes it looks like bringing them into meetings. Sometimes it looks like giving them money, uh, which is really helpful, uh, especially when you can tie it back to that super specific purpose and that specific place. Uh, if you know that a tribe in your area is struggling with water infrastructure, for example, find a way to donate um, so that they can have more water security. I want to, um, to wrap up this educational portion with plenty of time for uh, Q&A at the end with my own personal thoughts. And my first personal thought is, don't do exactly what I think. <laughs> um, everyone should come up with their own personal thoughts. But here are my specific rules for me. Um, one is organizations, including my own, I don't think should have a hard and fast rule about how or when they do land acknowledgements at meetings. And the main reason is it gives you an escape hatch from having to do that internal emotional work and really connecting it to a specific purpose. So if you have a rule, for example, it's like at every, at every public meeting we hold um, or with every new group of stakeholders we meet with, we do one of these, it, it's too easy to not think about why am I actually doing it with these people? What are, What's the specific reason and what am I driving people toward with this? Uh, so not a fan of organizational policies around this. When I am leading a meeting, um, I only do land acknowledgements if there's a very clear and specific purpose that I can share with the group. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, uh, that, that is really, really specific. And if I'm leading a meeting that's on accounting or budgeting, I'm probably less likely to do a land acknowledgement than if I'm doing something around um, 
uh, land transfers or uh, or like repairing riparian areas uh, on reservation land or with with a bunch of stakeholders uh, and the tribes are included. That's a place where I, I'll consult with the tribes and figure out, okay, here's the specific purpose. And again, I'll make sure I share that with the group before I actually go into any land acknowledgement. Um, my other thought is they should be super personal. So everyone should do your own research, uh, search your own heart and make decisions about how and when to do it yourself. Uh, Emily, who's here from Alignment Partnership with me, um, is a different person than I am. And so even if we were approaching the same group of people at the same meeting, Emily would and should do a land acknowledgement very differently than I would um, because Emily's interior is different. Emily's lived experience is different. Um, and, and being able to come at it from a place that's really personal and emotion driven is important, uh, especially to your indigenous and tribal partners. And remember, um, always connect your land acknowledgement to action. So I love land acknowledgements because they're an opportunity to build indigenous wealth and power. And you can be a really good ally by taking advantage of that. So uh, we've mentioned it in the emails and it's on the registration page. But one of the reasons I'm doing this webinar is as fundraiser for an organization I really love, uh, Changing Currents. And Changing Currents is an initiative to foster deeper collective dialogue about water protection, and it's important to tribal communities. Uh, they're based here in the Pacific Northwest, but they have programming all around uh, the Western United States. And their mission is really close to Willamette Partnerships. We do a lot of work around, um, you know, water infrastructure and making sure water quality and quantity is good for communities. And so by having this other organization uh, that we know the leadership, um, makes a lot of sense to help divert some resources that way. So before we do the Q&A, we're gonna have a little practice and that practice is in taking action. So I would like you uh, to go to changingcurrents.net, yes, right now, um, and donate money to Changing Currents. Uh, Darrell Kalika leads it. Um, and they lead tribal youth summits where they're teaching folks about uh, tribal water rights and uh, infrastructure challenges. And then the coolest part, I think, is they take the kids out afterward onto the water and have these recreational experiences um, that help build emotional, mental, uh, spiritual resilience and connection to those resources to foster leadership moving forward. So my recommendation uh, would be to go and donate $50 if you can, um, more if you would like. And I am actually going to sit here for 60 seconds very awkwardly so that everyone has a chance to go donate. Um, and once those 60 seconds are up, we'll come back here and we'll have some time for Q&A. Uh, but, but please, if you are able, um, help put your money where your mouth is. And for folks watching on YouTube later, don't skip this minute, go do it. <laughs> also important um, is to write changing currents in the memo line of the donate page uh, because their donations run through uh, the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians. All right, 
If you are still in the donation process, uh, please continue. I will be here uh, and wait around for your questions. Um, and Woody, you said it, it donates to, to ATNI. That's correct. Uh, if you put changing currents in the memo line, um, it'll go through them. And I'll give Darrell a heads up that uh, any donations coming in around 130 to 136 should probably be diverted. So if you've got any questions, um, feel free to pop them into the chat. It's probably easier than the Q&A. Um, I'm assuming there will be some, but if not, everyone just got gifted a bunch of time back. <laughs> Eve's got a question about where we can find this recording. Um, and Emily has built a lovely landing page on the Willamette Partnership website where we'll have all of the webinars uh, that we're presenting posted for the future. So we'll be sure to send that link out in a follow-up email probably uh, tomorrow once it's done uploading. Cheryl's got a great question, uh, which is, can you address land acknowledgements at events versus written on an organization's website? Um, I can, also knowing again that there are lots of different views here. So I have, uh, I've met folks who say they don't like to work with organizations who don't have a land acknowledgement on their website, um, just because they, they kind of want to see that value signaled. They want to know that uh, they are, they're actively thinking about uh, tribal sovereignty and indigenous rights. Um, I've also heard from people that it means nothing and maybe even makes them less likely to work with someone unless they can see other proof on their website that they're doing something about it. Um, so similarly to what I would say about doing it like in person or at an event, for example, if you can connect that land acknowledgement on your website with action um, and, and show how you are building tribal wealth and power, uh, I think that will go a lot further than just having it written out on your website. Uh, Ladon asked, uh, some organizations create a template for the entire staff. Uh, what do I think you should tell your leadership about it? Well, it depends. Um, if your organization is run by indigenous folks uh, or people who are tribal members, I think it's super cool to defer to them. <laughs> they kind of have uh, the trump card there and in doing what they think is best is more important than uh, what some rando in his office thinks is best. Um, but I would also say maybe try to start a conversation with them around some of what we talked about today. Um, about how it, it can be pretty traumatic, about how if people aren't trained how to do it, it can cause more damage to relationships with tribes and indigenous people than it can, you know, help them feel seen or heard um, or build power for them. Denise asks, uh, where do we find out what tribes are in our region? I know of a couple, but wouldn't want to miss one and not be able to talk with them. Uh, if you are able to talk with every tribe in your region, you're probably a federal employee. <laughs> and if you're not, then it's probably gonna be hard to get in the door at all of them. Um, there, there are a few different ways to go about this. One is just to look at a map of federally recognized tribes. So that definitely does not cover every single indigenous person. Um, I'm thinking of like Chinook Indian Nation here around Portland uh, does not have federal recognition, um, but uh, it's a really easy way to see, okay, as far as government to government relationship goes, where are these folks based? Where are these folks based? Um, when it comes to figuring out, you know, who, who used to live on the land, who traveled through the land, it's a lot stickier. Um, and again, there's not really an objective way to do it. So I, I've seen maps of the whole US, but then maybe especially of Oregon that have kind of like different overlapping zones. Um, just know that they're very soft borders. And so it's, it's okay if you mess up the, the who and the what. Um, 
what's really important is, is where it's coming from in your heart and why you're doing it. Vanessa asks, uh, how can we get more involved with Willamette Partnership or Changing Currents? Uh, call me, Vanessa. I'm really happy to, to learn more about you, um, what you do, and Willamette Partnership really thrives on collaboration. That's how we work. And so, yeah, if there's something um, that we can collaborate on or work together, I'd be happy to hear about it. Matt asks, for orgs not doing a lot of work directly related to tribes, uh, what's my opinion on an example of an event or meeting when it would be appropriate to do a land acknowledgement? Um, so thinking back to the time I did one most recently, which honestly was probably about a year ago, um, was with this new collaborative project uh, based in the Portland metro area. And we had, I think, four or five different organizations represented, a lot of whom are landowners uh, or manage natural resources here. And we were starting to set out a process for stakeholder or community engagement. And so I wanted to make sure um, that, that we acknowledged the land and the tribes that are still very active here uh, in the Portland region just to make sure that that's a context that we're building into our whole process. So it's not like tribes would be a nice box to check. Um, it's, it, it was really something that I wanted to guide our process for how we were doing the, the stakeholder engagement and, and make partners reflect on, um, on their own responsibility for, for doing the process right, but also being respectful to the land and the resources. Uh, Scott asks about interpretive and educational panels, um, and sounds like you're already doing some consulting with tribes, so I'd say just listen to them. Um, their, their word and what they want is definitely the most important, uh, so if, if they request that you do it in a certain way, then you should do it in that way. Uh, Shamis? I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, um, asked uh, thoughts are about uh, land acknowledgements on like interpretive signs and things that are fixed. I think those are really good. And I would say don't do them unless you can consult <laughs> with the tribe you're writing about. Uh, it, it takes a long time and we'll get into that some in the next webinar about uh, things just moving a little bit slower in Indian country than they do in a lot of our um, more Western style offices, but it is very worth spending that time um, and, and building those relationships with cultural department and really internalizing those learnings so that you can make sure you're sharing them uh, in the proper way. Uh, Whitney asks if there's value in posting a temporary land acknowledgement with the acknowledgement that it's a work in progress or better to wait uh, to craft one super carefully. Um, I would say every land acknowledgement is a work in progress, honestly, uh, just because land and the concept of ownership is something that's always in flux. So not to get like really meta and throw the question back at you, um, but, but yeah, I, I don't think there's a, an objectively right way to say, this is what it is. So if you feel like you've got a good purpose for it, uh, if it's coming from your heart, I think you can be really honest and open and say like, hey, this is where I'm at right now. Uh, this is why I am doing this right now, even though maybe I could use a couple more years to workshop it and figure it out exactly. Um, it, as long as that, that respect and that emotion uh, is what's driving it and not a desire to be objectively right, I think you'll be okay. Man, all these questions, you guys, great. Uh, Ari has a question about if I have other ideas for actions. Um, they do uh, land acknowledgements at most of their forest defense meetings and are not sure they can ask folks to donate every time. Um, lots of other potential actions you could take. Um, I would also wonder though, if you're doing a land acknowledgement at every single one of the meetings, what that purpose is. Um, I think your purpose should really drive your action. So in donating to Changing Currents, for example, um, 
part of why I'm doing it is I, I want people to be more aware of the cool work they're doing um, and educating tribal youth about water issues. And I want them to have more money uh, because it directly relates to my work at the Lima Partnership uh, and the way we work. So um, thinking about like a forest defense meeting, uh, lots of connections to forests and forest health and the tribes around you. So um, if, if there's that specific purpose that you can think of first, I bet you'll be able to think of other actions. And that could be like uh, incorporating some traditional ecological knowledge into your forest practices. It can be like um, having an advisory committee that you make sure there are chairs reserved for tribal members on um, so that they're able to help steer some of those management practices, uh, kind of all kinds of things. Uh, Ava asks, uh, is curious if others are honoring or highlighting Native American Heritage Month as well, um, which yes, is November. So um, happy Native American Heritage Month. And uh, I am honoring it by, by leading some of these webinars. Um, and I think there are lots of things that our organizations can do uh, to, to highlight and push those stories out. So if you've got like a good social media channel, um, if you have partners or are leading, uh, you know, educational seminars or meetings, um, all kinds of, all kinds of ideas there. I'm curious to hear how you're doing it, Ava. Laura asks, uh, they're considering adding a land acknowledgement to their annual habitat restoration conservation reports. Um, and what are your thoughts on this? So, uh, it depends on, on what else you're doing. Um, I know I do some work with the land trust community and here in Oregon, they've been on a, a learning journey through the last year-ish, um, just a, about how tribes view land and what that relationship is like, um, what it means to be like a white-led organization who owns a bunch of land um, that we did not initially occupy. Um, and so in, in covering that kind of vast area that you mentioned, the whole Pacific Northwest, um, plus some of California, it's going to be hard to mention every tribe. Um, but I, I wonder what your, what's your purpose there? Do, are people who are going to be reading these, will they, will they not know that the land was occupied or, or do they know that already? And there's like another action you want to push them toward, um, do you want to highlight some work that some of your tribal partners are doing in that area? Uh, all, all kinds of potential options there. Also, I'm sorry, I recognize that a lot of my answers are, I'm not going to tell you, <laughs> but that's kind of the thing about land acknowledgements, as they're, they're really difficult to know exactly how to do right, um, unless you are the person who's crafting them. I will wait for one more minute to see if there are any other questions. Um, in the meantime, uh, please join us in a few weeks. Emily's going to type the date into the chat because I forget it uh, for when our final <laughs> webinar will be. Um, and again, that is working in Indian country. So that's going to look more at how do you work with tribes? Um, what are some things you can expect? How can you be culturally responsive and appropriate uh, and, and be the best partner as possible to indigenous communities that you're working in? All right, and that was my one minute. So uh, with that, very heartfelt thank you to all of you for coming today. Uh, we'll be sure to send this recording out in a follow-up email if you wanna share with anybody. I am always available for follow-up via email, uh, which will also be in that follow-up email. Um, and I'm hopeful that I get to see all of you in just a few weeks for the next one. Thanks everybody.